Thank you. Um, we're starting another year of partnering with the library with these programs. We love the programs. We love the space. And it'll build up as the year goes on. Um, we usually, usually the first one doesn't have as many people. And then people get the word out that we're having programs again. And they start to come more as we get into the summer. But tonight's program is really important because it's the beginning of another phase of the Rockland History Project. It's something that we've been talking about uh, probably all through the pandemic. Um, we, when we had to shut down, we were just starting to formulate the thought about filming and talking to and taking copies of photographs and written information from regular families that lived in Rockland and the Rockland area. We know so much about the people who owned the business and controlled the lime industry and the shipyards, but we don't know about those of us like my family, when they came here, they were worn out and they moved and lived up behind Dodges Mountain for three or four generations. And there are interesting stories from every family that lived here. So we're going to publicize, we're going to go forward with talking to regular Rockland people. And heading up this program is Professor uh, Merriam, who is Steve, to, to me, Steve Merriam. And Steve is the third generation that I've worked with in the Rockland Historical Society. His grandmother was our first secretary. And his grandfather, Paul, was one of the working founding people in the Rockland Historical Society. I can remember the first photographic exhibit we ever put up. My father and Paul Merriam were hanging the pictures up at the old museum. Well, not that old, John Bird lived there. Um, out, up at the building on Lime Rock Street. And uh, Paul and Doris both worked for a long time. And um, Second generation was Gil, who's been the ultimate volunteer because he's come in ever since we've had a place where he could sit down and do research and do organizing. And he's made his own way through collections. He's done an immense amount of work over the years. And then third generation is Steve, who's heading up this project. So without saying anything else myself, I want to turn it over to Steve and say thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Brian. I really appreciate that. Uh, before I start, I want to thank the library, especially M. Lewis here, who's really holding down the fort in terms of the, bringing these programs to, to the rest of the community. Also, the RHS board, Rockland Historic Society board, several members are here tonight. That, that's great. And volunteers, especially the volunteers who have uh, worked with me on this program, and you'll get a chance to get to know them a little bit in a minute, but really want to thank uh, that. And finally, our curator, Ann Morris, who was really essential in getting this off the ground with me um, about a year and a half, two years ago. This is a long project, and she's worked mightily uh, for to bring it to life, to realize. Finally a huge and important thank you to the estate of Warren Bodine, who was very generously donated money to this program. Um, and uh, we will, uh, it really, we could not have done this without uh, the estate. So uh, really thank you for, for that. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this program. Um, can you hear me okay? You can hear you? Okay. Okay, I'll, how about that? Do I sound like God now? I'll, I'll see if I can remember to, 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 uh, to speak a little louder. 
Uh, I'm going to give an overview to start out with this program, how it began. Um, it actually began several years ago by um, at least one of the people in this room, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Then I'll then I'll talk about where we're going with it, where we are now, and where we're going to, with it, uh, and then really drive home the nuts and bolts of the program. You'll get a good sense of what we're going to be doing here coming up in the next few years. The whole purpose of this, um, and this is going out to especially to those on Zoom, is to really, really uh, make a very strong pitch that it's the Rockland Communities Program. It's not the Historical Society's program. This program is for the community, and it should be community-run, community-developed. We're here as facilitators. Um, we want to make sure that you leave at least with that idea. We'll have a question and answer period near the end. If you want to have questions, hold those if you don't. Um, don't mind. Um, so I'm going to start with a definition. Um, many of you have heard of oral history. Um, uh, oral history. Uh, the Texas Historical Commission, well, this is a great organization. Actually, their guide to creating oral histories is the best that we've ever seen. We've used a lot of research to develop the program. By far, that little pamphlet right there gave us so much more information that, that, is, that is important. Their definition of oral history is that it's a collection of recording of personal memoirs for historical documentation. So that's important. This is not something like StoryCorps. Do you know who what StoryCorps is about? Or, we, or The Moth, where, where you people come on, or Humans of New York, remember that book? This is not sort of like that, but it's not like that. These are stories that have historical relevance. And so, um, and we assume that there are two kinds of history. There's the history that many people associate with our society, and that's factual history, like my dad, Gil, going in Tuesdays and Thursdays and doing uh, research on a particular topic, whether that's a ship, whether that's the lime industry, whether that's the last resort house, the last chance house at the end of Mechanic Street. Many of you know what that is. I won't tell you, but he does historical re research very specific historical research that's secondary research, not primary research, secondary research. And so um, the, the other kind of history is oral history or spoken history. And spoken history is really designed to fill out the stories of that, of that secondary research, make history more real, make it his story and her story instead of history with uh, a, a capital H. So the idea behind these kinds of oral history stories that we're going to be collecting is to show how people felt what it was like to be that during that time, to talk about stories, but really about memoirs and memory. And that's an important thing to remember tonight. Memory is key in oral histories. I mean, people don't realize that, but we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as, we, as we go. So it's a really good idea to remember as an oral historian to find out what not only what happened during the Great Fire of 1952 in Rockland, but what it was like to be there. And I'm, there are people in this room who were there who know. Um, we want to record the, that information for posterity to make sure that we have an active record of that as, we, as the, the city grows over the next hundred years or so. That's our mission. We're, we're really not alone in that. Um, there have been oral histories collected in Rockland since at least the 1990s. Anybody? Remember, or anybody see Out of Our Past, that show that's on community television? Yeah, that's, um, that was done by Gem Productions. My father was involved in that, along with Wayne Gray. Um, those were just interviews with people who, who have, many of them have passed on, people like Captain Dick Spear, um, the Rockland Cowboy, Mike Lowenthal? Lowenthal, yeah. Leventhal, excuse me, sorry about that, Mike. Um, these are currently still really popular shows. So there is a, there is a, this, this is 30 years ago these were produced and there still really is an, is an interest. And when we talk about, when I talk to people about this project, they're interested in developing and in, in, in kind of participating in this. Um, so uh, it, it's important to remember that we are the legacy of the early fathers and mothers who created this kind of oral history project in in, in Rockland. Um, the project itself, uh, the iteration, as Brian mentioned, really began to take shape in the summer of 2021. Um, 
And we initially thought that um, we would do kind of a forensic analysis or forensic uh, exploration of some of the stories in Rockland. Um, that means that we would talk about, we would seek out people who were participating in industries that were changing. And of course, we all know now that John's book, John Bird's book has come out. We all know that Rockland has a reputation for continually reinventing itself all the, through, through these industries. And so our initial thought was to capture the human stories that chronicle those uh, changes. Um, and so we partner, partnered in early, early uh, in the fall of 2021, we partnered with the Liberal Arts and STEM Academy at Oceanside High School run by Jenny Cross. We had five students who agreed to join this program for class credit. Um, we assigned them topics, and those topics were the NSKK Motorcycle Group, which was popular in um, Rockland in the 70s, and also the year that the Lobster Festival almost folded, which I believe is 92, something like that. Is that right, Dad? Yeah, right, 1992. So those students, five of them, in teams of two, went out and they did research. They did some research. They did um, some initial interviews. Um, and um, it didn't work. We, we realized we had made some tremendous mistakes. And so uh, it was a great opportunity for us to retool, which we've done. And um, it, we learned that this is much more complex, much more, anybody recognize those people? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, th this is much more complex, this project, uh, than simply just recording people speaking. We needed to do more research to help those students. We did not do this project justice in, in that way. Students needed more help identifying the subjects, not to mention the conducting the, the um, historical research. We also learned that we needed to train interviewers for this. We, can't we couldn't rely on students' innate knowledge to be able to ask the right questions. And if you've ever done any interviews, you realize that these are not conversations. These have to be planned out. Oral interviews, spoken word interviews have to be researched and planned out very specifically and carefully. And, and so uh, we did uh, a disservice to those students by that. Um, they needed to be invested. Those students needed to be invested in the subjects that, that, that they were interviewing. So we went back to the drawing board. We focused the project away from dying industries now. And we started thinking about doing oral history of the people who were alive today. In other words, we shifted our audience from the people who are alive today to the people who are gonna be living 100 years from now, who wanna know about your stories today, okay? And that focus opened up a whole range of possibilities for us because first of all, we weren't stuck with um, uh, talking about industries that have changed in Rockland's history. John Bird does an excellent, excellent job at describing that. The other books like Rockland during the War Homefront on the Penobscot does a great job at that as well. What we don't have is a record of your stories for a future audience. That's what we really wanted to focus on um, here. So, and we really, uh, and we also de decided that we needed to do this program at least it, it, with much more editorial control this time around than, than we did with the partnership with Oceanside. Um, we, we definitely um, wanted to keep it as much in-house as possible so we could have some control over the process, at least initially. And then we, our idea was to turn that over to the rest of um, the community. And that's really what we wanted to do. We wanted to create a, a team of community historians, okay? The biggest thing we learned from that experience and from other research that we began doing coming out of that was that people are more comfortable talking to people they know. It's much easier to talk to someone if you know them. It's much easier to respond to someone if you're if you know them. We expect the students to know their subjects. They had no idea who the NSKK was when we, when we imposed that topic on them. Um, we also realized that even though we knew the historical background, 
especially with the NSKK Motorcycle Club, we were still removed from that subject's experience. We couldn't find anybody who was part of that club. That was a part of the problem. Remember, we're dealing with memories here. We're not dealing with objective facts. We're dealing with people's memories of specific events and their interaction and feelings during those, those times. And sometimes those can be very painful memories. One of the things that happens to people's memories, it, it not only ca categorizes ex events and experiences, it blocks them out too. And so there are people, uh, we, we, have to be we had to be careful with that. And the students, we didn't really understand that. At, 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 the, at that time, we wanted to, we thought it would just be make it, we thought we could just make it easy for subjects to tell their story completely, and it didn't really work out like that. Nuts and bolts, over the last year, we've really formatted this program, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about what it, it involves first. Here's a very quick walkthrough. If basically someone in the community approaches us with an idea about someone they know telling their story, okay? That's the first step. We sit down and talk with those two people and we being the volunteers, me and maybe one of our advisory board group members, we sit down and talk with those people and we discuss how we can partner with them to bring their stories out. In other words, we're facilitators, we're not authors. We're training and facilitating the transmission of these, of these great, great stories. We also have to make sure at this early stage that everybody has a buy-in to the project. For example, if a, if, a, if a young teenager is interested in uh, interviewing his aunt and the aunt is reticent, we'll, we're not gonna get a good interview if that isn't overcome, okay? We are also dealing with memories that fade. One of the people we have on our list to talk about is a 99-year-old woman who's watched the South End change over the last 199 years. Now, she has limited capacity to, for her memory because of the process of aging, obviously. So we have to be careful on how we, we um, kind of approach that. And that initial stage is called vetting. So we work with the person to make sure that uh, the, the, the subject is actually uh, good. Remember that... Um, the, the story we're looking for has to have a kind of a minimum threshold of, of historical relevance. Uh, we use a group of advisors like David Grima and Eva Murray to, to, to vet, to, to see if those stories are relevant um, and if there's enough information to yield. We use the board to yield a good interview. We use the board and the volunteers who have an intimate knowledge of our collection to see if there is information that we can add to that interview, okay? That's, the, that's also re, the, the biggest challenge at this stage is finding relevant, relevant people to, to interview because frankly, not all stories justify interviews. Um, there's a story about a harbor seal um, who turns up in Rockport Harbor. That just really, that isn't really that interesting. Rock Harbor seals come and go in Rockport Harbor. But if you raise a harbor seal in your bathtub and the harbor seal becomes an icon of the city of Rockport and gets its own statue, comes back every year for several years, becomes a fixture on the docks of Rockport, that's a story. If your neighbor has a cat on the south end who likes to sit at the end of the wharf on at Snow's, what used to be Snow's shipyard and just stare out at the harbor, not really interesting. If that cat suddenly starts walking across the water to Cooper's Beach on Al's head, that's a story, and that's interesting. So the early vetting process, the early vetting process is, is important. We then interview people. We, we, we then te teach the people, teach the interviewer how to interview, and I'll explain that process in a minute. We do all interviews in our little studio, which is down the hall. You can stop by there if you haven't already on the way over to the great snacks that are available after this talk, this presentation. And we then edit that video and audio. We then um, do post-production on that. And you're the, everybody's in, more than welcome to, to uh, the interview and the subject are part of that if they wanna be. And then our goal is to, uh, what we will do is we will post those interviews three places. One, the website that we were developing for the Rockland Historical Society. Two, Main State Archives. They want a record of these videos. 
um, they will be archived at the Maine State Archives in Augusta. And the subject and the interviewer will get a copy, of course, as well. Now, these are owned, these interviews are owned and copyrighted by the Rockland Historical Society, but they're free. They'll be shown hopefully on television at some point, we'll see. But it's a great keepsake and it's a good record of your partnership, if you're doing this, with us and with the, the people who you're honoring by, 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 by interviewing, okay? Um, our, our goal, our default for all of this was to try to combine video and audio. We didn't want to just use audio. Um, there's so much detail that you can catch in a person's face when you're talking to them. Um, they should show emotions, especially. There's also a lot of opportunity to, to understand the person if they're out of a location, like the studio over there. So one of our goals, as I'll talk about, is to go live to go, not live, but go offsite and interview people in their own homes. Because, and we are, have, we, we will become very good at identifying great backgrounds to, to tell maybe a different story, maybe the same story that the subject is telling. You know, photobombing, the same principle. You look at what's behind the subject sometimes and get a lot more information about that. These are short also, no more than 15 minutes preferably shorter than that. The reason is we want to focus only on one story. Um, we want to go into that story deeply, but we want to, we're going to use a nugget of that story to, to sort of like rhizomes or like grass roots rise up um, and create a bigger, um, a bigger patch of lawn to follow the analogy through. That's how we work. <clears throat> so, the next question, and this is a big challenge, who can be interviewed here uh, on these? We, we went back and forth on this. And the people, when we made it, a, we decided to make it a pretty wide um, group of people. Anybody, anybody who has an interesting story, yes, defined by us, about Rockland is able and encouraged to come and talk and record that story. As I said, it has to be historically relevant and the threshold again for that historical relevance is pretty low. It doesn't have to be anything earth shaking. Um, if it's a moderately interesting story, like a cat walking across the cove, that's enough to be part of this, uh, of, of this program, all right? Um, <clears throat> all parties, of course, have to sign an initial agreement. We don't wanna make, we don't wanna put anybody in legal jeopardy um, who has an interesting story um, about Rockland. Um, and at that point, when we, um, <clears throat> when we agree that this is a good person to, to interview, then we, we, the Historical Society and our volunteers, we start the research, the secondary research. The, people be the person being interviewed is the primary research. That's primary. Secondary research is published research. And we, that's when we began, begin to do our, our work and gather um, resources. Um, and we've actually begun this process. We've done our first initial vetting interview. It took about five minutes. The person we interviewed is with us tonight. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the process that we went, to, went through with that. This is Cindy. Um, Cindy sitting up in front. Cindy Colson. If anybody has heard that name before, Colson, you realize that the Colson family has been in this city, in Rockland, in the Midcoast area for a long, long time. Sort of like the Birds and the Merriams and all those other people. Um, Cindy's daughter, Charity, is on the board, and she suggested that we might want to start with her to interview Cindy. And so, sounds great. Let, let's get together. Cindy came in. We talked. It turns out this is her story. When she was two, her father, who was a World War II veteran, got a job returning from the war and worked at the, the Rockland Lime Company, okay? One lunch, during lunch one day, he, no one was around, so he was asked to take a customer's order. As he took the order, he fell into the lime kiln and he suffocated. He died immediately. Um, that's Cindy's grand, that was Cindy's father. She was two years old. She was the youngest of eight children. He left to Cindy's mother um, to, to which she did, to, to raise the kids and pro provide for them. 
Um, what we discovered was that that is the kind of story we like to hear about, because think about all the possibilities for us as historians and researchers, the lime industry, sailors and soldiers returning to Rockland. Cindy's father was from an Italian immigrant family. His father was a, fought in World War I, okay? Um, factual history is still important, but as we began to uncover the stories, uh, the story of, of Cindy's father, we started finding uh, uh, th other, you can't really see that, can you? That's from the Courier Gazette in June of 1959. Yep, um, that's the, the article that talks about the death of Cindy's father. Now, these kinds of things provide deeper contextual information to that story. In this case, the published story allows us to fill in more and more details. And in terms of the actual video that we're producing, we intersperse images like this, along with images that she provides, as well as images that we have at the Historical Society of things associated with lime, for example, showing workers working in the, in the, in the quarries, to give a broader contextual background of this individual story. Now, at this point, you have to realize, of course, that this is not just a conversation that we're recording. It takes a lot of research, a lot of spade work to really come and develop this interesting story for the future generations of, in, in Rockland. And that's our job. Our job is to facilitate Cindy and her daughter developing this story and, and really um, um, and, and really bringing it to light in a way that is interesting beyond secondary resources, okay? So we do background research. That's at this stage, we would work with the two people and we would do background research. And then it's very important to help those people develop what are called prompts. Um, a lot of times people don't like to tell stories unless they're asked to tell them by individual people who they know. That also, it's an axiom that sometimes people don't know what's interesting about their lives. They're too busy living their lives. They don't know about what's interesting in their lives. For example, Cindy's father not only was a World War II veteran, but he fought at D-Day. He received a Purple Heart. He was in the Battle of the Bulge in Bastogne. He came back to Rockland after those amazing worldwide experiences, married and had eight children. That kind of information fills out, fills out the, the image we have of, his, of, of her father. And our job in creating what are called prompts are to kind of jog Cindy's memory about, about those things, because she may not think that kind of information is really interesting. He lived the life. She lived, the, she didn't, she, it's her experience. But sometimes people like that need an outside source, an objective source to tease those memories out. And that's our job to, and prompts are not, by the way, are not the questions that we will ask or she, Cindy's daughter will ask in the actual interview. Cindy won't know those questions because we need to keep the interview fresh. But prompts are designed, are questions to des designed early on in the non-interview such kind of scenario to get Cindy to, to re remember that, okay? When we do that, when the, rock, the volunteers, so I'll point out in a minute, when we do that, what we're doing is we're standing in for the audience, not you, the audience now, but the audience 50 to 100 years from now. We are their representatives come back to make sure that you are telling us the most information, most pertinent information, most interesting information um, based on what we think they would want to know about, okay? So that's part of our goal is to become objective and provide um, an, an audience. Um, it's the people who will be watching this in 50 to 100 years. For example, this image, anybody know what this is? Several people, I'm sure you're just not raising your hands because you know, everybody knows who did. This is the Berry Brothers fire in 1920. Yeah, um, imagine what we could learn had someone captured that person's story who was there 
Imagine that. I mean, this is actually on Main Street. Imagine then if they also lived through the fire of 1952 in Raqqa. If we record those stories, imagine what more we, we could learn. We could fill out the story by helping that interviewer come up with a different contextual kind of approach to fire fires in, in Rockland. That's been over a hundred years. That's happened over a hundred years ago. And yet we still have a photographic record. What we don't have is an oral spoken record. So the key takeaways for, for this stage of the, of the process is that we will develop with the interviewer prompts, not questions, but prompts to help flesh out the individual skeletal memories of the interviewee. That's one of our, our jobs. We're standing in for the audience when we do that. Okay, then comes the actual interview, the, conducting the actual interview. For now, as I've mentioned, we're going to be conducting all the, you know who those people are? Everybody's looking quizzically. You, you're trying to read the names? I can tell you they're the Emery family from Alice Head. I think that's my great great grandfather. Well, somewhere in there, I don't know. Um, for, for now, we're conducting the interviews in that, in that room over there. And the reason, as I said, because we need some control and we eventually want to go on location for reasons I talked about um, um, a minute ago. So if a couple, like if Cindy and Charity will want to pursue the process and actually sit down with the interview, we'll do it there. We've gone through all kinds of technological machinations to find out which is the most efficient camera, which is the most efficient microphone, how to light, how to turn off air conditioning sounds, how to, how to um, keep that room dark. Um, we've decided on, after lots of, hemming and hawing, we decided on keeping it simple. We're going to be filming with an iPad. We're going to be recording sound with an iPad. There will be no lavalier mics, no separate microphones. Um, and we will be um, having minimal light. We'll be doing some on the fly editing in the software on, iPad, um, on the Mac um, to keep uh, light under control. Um, and then um, that's it. By the time of the um, interview, everybody will be familiar with, with each other. Everybody will be familiar with each other. You'll know the process. It will be easy. You may not know the questions, but it, the process will be um, easy. We will be there. Our job will be to manage the technology. Our job will not to be, at this point, be asking questions. That's not our job. That's the person who was interviewed. That's Charity's job. Okay? We're simply there to make sure everything goes smoothly. How long does this take? So the general rule of thumb um, is that it takes 20 minutes for every of develop, total development time for every minute of film. So if you have 20 minutes of film, final film, which is too long, you have 400 minutes. What's 20 times 20? 4,000 minutes, right? I was an English major. 4,000 minutes, 400, damn. So um, 400 minutes, that's, that's a conservative estimate. It's more like an hour per minute. And that includes everything from initial vetting interview to post-production. So, um, but we want to budget two hours, one to two hours per session because people will know um, the two, the interviewee and the subject, interviewer and the subject will be pretty much um, familiar with each other um, uh, with each other at that time. Key takeaway here, we'll be there for you if you decide to do this. Our job is to make sure that comes off easy. You as an interviewee and as a subject, interviewer and a subject will be very prepared for this interview. Won't be off the cuff in any stretch, by any stretch of the imagination. Then, know where that is? You know what that image is? 52 fire, yep. Then we edit. And what, what that means is that then we, then we get together. Usually that will be driven by us since we have editing software or will have editing software. We cut down the raw editor, the, the raw interview into um, a, a, an interview that can be published or seen. It's, for example, 
many times interviewers and interviewees get lost in the interview. An interviewer may, an interviewee or subject may say something they wish to attract, they may flub up. All that gets erased in the in the editing process. So editing basically is cutting out uh, cutting out things. Um, this is not going to be a live interview where you don't get a chance to re reclaim what you say. We will this will be totally uh, recorded, and we use software to do that. And we imagine you working with us along that editorial um, um, process. But editing isn't only taking stuff away, it's adding as well. So at the editing process, then we dump your photographs into, we cut away from your, the, the vision, you know, the image of you speaking to photographs that you provide or that we provide. So there will be a montage of photographs and we'll cut back and forth between you speaking and those photographs, maybe some silent video, all of that. We'll be adding that information that we've done with, through the research process that I described earlier at the at that time at the edit editing time um this will help again the audience see the person behind the um behind the person actually speaking speaking seeing images photographs of that and by the way we keep all extra footage that ends up that we don't use you get a you get a copy of that because that too is part of historic the historical record it's not just what's produced it's how it's produced that's one of the great things about contextual history like this. Okay, winding down here. Post-production, I couldn't figure out where this whale was. Yeah. Put it Mechanic Street, you were? How'd it smell? Okay, so we need to know that, right? That would be the question that... Found it. Uh-huh. Great. Take that out. Right. Well, I, I was trying to figure it out. I thought it was. There, you can't see it in the picture, but there's some ships out there. You know, you can see the breakwater. Yeah, naval vessels in breakwater. So at this stage, the raw footage is edited. It's almost ready to go. This is called the post-production stage. And this is the time that we become historians. For example, we have to create a transcript of these interviews. That's part of a, the historical record. We have to do that. These aren't just stories that are recorded. They have to have a written transcript. Um, so we, we will do that and we'll, or we will help you do that as part of the, that's one of the things that you do in oral histories. We will also deliver the interview at this point to the two places that I mentioned before, which is, the website and at the main state archives, our, it's our responsibility to upload those. And we will develop, we'll give you a final copy at this stage too. If you want a copy for your family or at that point, you have become one of us, you are a local historian. And so you deserve that, that item. And of course, if you're doing this with us, you have as much input as you want to have at every stage along the way from prompting to post-production. Um, this is your project, your, your project. Okay, we'll wrap up. In five years, we would like this program, we would like to see this project turn into a program. In other words, it's a project now. We're not sure if it's gonna, gonna make it. We'd like it to be its own living project, program project, with its own inertia that keep going um, throughout the, the years. That means that you have to take it over at some point. The community has to be part of this. In fact, the community has to take over this process. Um, it ha they have to, to, to own that. It's true that we will only become, we'll, we are facilitators of that. Um, we would also, as I mentioned, in five years, we can imagine ourselves doing location filming. That's a short-term goal, so it'll probably be um, sooner than five years. We're working with some of our advisors to make that happen. Um, we're also exploring other distribution outlets for these. Um, for example, it's very easy during the editing process to create 30-second trailers of these interviews. And one of the things we hope to do is offer them to the Strand to play before before films. 
um, as, as um, kind of outreach efforts on the part of the historical society to get more people involved in our society and, and in um, local history. Um, and also broadcast them on community television if possible. I mean, out of our past is still being broadcast 30, over 30 years. And so there is an interest in, in, in local history. Um, anybody know where this is from? Don't tell them, Dad. Okay. Don't. I said, don't tell them. <laughs> okay. Yep. It's in front of the Strand, 1942. Uh, it's a scrap drive. Um, we don't know who this person is, but you can tell a lot about this person by how he looks. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We wore old coat ties and had top cardboard shirts, cardboard fronts. Yep. So um, that's where we're hoping to go with this program. And the what we learned from the Oceanside experience, the student experience, is that we can't do this. We just simply can't do it. We can provide the con the facilities, we can provide the technological, the technical details, but it will not go, go forward if the community isn't enthused about this. Um, it's sort of um, if you build it, they will come kind of deal. And if people are really interested in doing this, they have to make, they, we would hope that they have to make um, the effort to reach out to us and, um, and um, become really local historians, like many of these kids did. This is 1929, Purchase Street, Street School. Um, if you look at these faces, I think this person right here, this girl became a female wrestler. Um, this guy's Mr. Happy. But, but they're, they're, all these pictures tell a story. Look at this kid's face. Um, so remember that history is his story and her story. We don't really know, again, if this is going to work unless it depends on the community, unless the community does it. If you are interested in helping, or if you know somebody who would like to interview, or be interviewed, or if you know somebody who would like to interview someone, my email address there is, that's a temporary email address for this until we get our website up, but you can reach out. Um, if you're interested only in just working with us in this project, that would be very welcome uh, as well. We have four incredible volunteers. We have seven volunteers in the Historical Society now. We have four incredible, including a woman with documentary film experience at, in New York who's, who's working with us now. She's a volunteer. Every week she, com she comes in. Um, and with that, um, that's it. Any questions as we go? go um, I think there's refreshments in the Histor Historical Society down the way. Um, and I'm going to invite you to stop by our little studio on your track down the, down the hallway. Um, I'll open it up. It's a storage room with a big black curtain in the back of it. I want to warn you, there's no cigarette smoke and it's dusty musical instruments in it and everything. We want you to join us. Now this, you know what this door, this picture is? Famous picture. It's a strand during World War II. Uh, bond drive. Yep. That's my great grandfather, mother, right? Um, who's this? No? <laughs> they were supposed to guess. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Leo Canell, that's fine. Leo Canell. I think right here, right, Dad? Uh, yeah. Like, okay, yeah. Yeah, well, that was only on the weekends. Okay, any questions? Any questions about this? If, if not, tell your friends, tell your pets, tell your hairstylist. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Steve. Yes. Thank you.